Welcome to Computing Probabilities of Compound Events, a video lesson for probability and statistics. Now that we have established a sound foundation for probability by using Kolmogorov's framework, we are ready to begin efficiently computing the probabilities of compound events using a combination of Venn diagrams and computational rules that derive from elementary set theory and Kolmogorov's axioms. One of the great values of Kolmogorov's axioms is that they allow us to bring the power of set theory to bear upon the problem of computing probabilities of compound events. In a general sense, the axioms and resultant theorems allow us to break highly complex compound events into manageable parts for which we can quickly find probabilities, and then provides us with a way to piece these results together into a single probability for the original compound event. We will illustrate how this works with several examples. So let's imagine within a rodent colony, 49% of the animals are bubonic plague carriers. 31% are in the first year of their life and 8% of the animals belong to both categories. We anticipate the need to compute probabilities of compound events within this system. So let's begin by assigning notation to the given data. First, let B represent the event a rodent is a bubonic plague carrier. Then let F represent the event that a rodent is in its first year of life. So we'll use this notation to summarize the data we've been given. We'll let P of B equal 0.49 represent the probability a rodent in the colony is a plague carrier. We'll let P of F equal 0.31 represent the probability a rodent in the colony is in its first year of life. And we'll let P of B intersect F equal 0.08 represent the probability a rodent in the colony is a plague carrier and in its first year of life. We can use this given data to label all of the independent sectors of our Venn diagram with probabilities. This will help us summarize everything it is that we know about our rodent colony from the given data. One piece of information we were given was that P of B intersect F equals 0.08. We use that to label the intersection sector of the Venn diagram with a 0 0.08. But we can move forward from that. We can compute P of B but not F using the, um, using the relative complement rule. So we know that P of B but not F equals P of B minus P of B intersect F. And that's known information. So if we work out that probability, we see that P of B but not F is just 0 0.41. So we label the Venn diagram with a 0 0.41 in the exclusively B sector. Likewise, we can label the exclusively F region of the Venn diagram following a similar process. We know from the relative complement formula that P of F but not B equals P of F minus P of F intersect B. And those two quantities on the right-hand side of the formula are known, so when we work out the resulting probability, we see that P of F but not B, or the exclusively F region, has a probability of 0 0.23. At this point, we can see that the only unlabeled sector of our Venn diagram is the probability of the complement of B union F. We can determine the probability of B union F itself simply by inspecting the parts of the diagram we have labeled so far. These are the interiors of the B or F circles, and we've labeled each of those probabilities. It's 0 0.41, 0 0.08, and 0.23. So the probability of B union F is the sum of those values, which comes out to 0.72. So if we know the probability of B union F, we can determine the probability of its complement, and that comes out to be 0.28. This completes the process of labeling all of the independent sectors in our Venn diagram with a probability. Having a completed Venn diagram like this puts us in a great position to be able to compute probabilities of just about any other compound event we might dream up for this system of rodents living in a colony. In other words, we may now efficiently compute just about any probability of any compound event we might imagine relative to our system. 
For instance, we could ask what's the probability a rodent from the colony is a plague carrier or in the first year of its life. This is the probability of the union, P of B union F, and it's represented by the shaded region in our Venn diagram. Now we've already computed this, but if we, we look at the shaded region, we see that in order to compute the union, we just have to sum up the pro three probabilities that label the independent sectors within that union. So the probability of B union F is just 0 0.41 plus 0 0.08 plus 0 0.23, which comes out to be 0.72. Well, we might also ask what's the probability a rodent from the colony is not a plague carrier or it is not in the first year of its life. This is the probability of B complement union F complement. And with the aid of De Morgan's law, we could re rewrite that as the probability of the complement of B intersect F. That tells us to look at our diagram and shade everything outside of B intersect F. In order to compute the probability of that compound event, <clears throat> we simply need to add up the individual probabilities of the independent sectors in it, or 0.41 plus 0.23 plus 0.28, and that sums to 0.92. Well, now we might ask, what is the probability a rodent is a plague carrier, but not in its first year of life, or it is in its first year of life, but not a plague carrier? This is a pretty complex compound event, and we can interpret it to be the probability of B intersect F complement union B complement intersect F. But another more intuitive way of thinking about that is that we are just looking at the probability of the union between the B only region and the F only region. And that's how I've shaded this diagram. So when we look at that, we see that the probabilities that need to go into our sum are just 0.41 and 0.23. So for this compound event, that gives us a total probability of 0.64. Finally, we might ask, what's the probability that a rodent from the colony is not a plague carrier or it is in the first year of its life? This is the probability of B complement union F. And so, we shade our Venn diagram to reflect all of the outcomes that either are in B complement, so they're outside of the B circle, or they are in the F circle, or possibly both regions. And this gives us the shaded region that is depicted on the screen, and we can see that it really results in everything outside of the exclusively B sector. So to compute its probability, we just have to add the probabilities of 0 0.28, 0 0.08, and 0.23. That gives us a probability of 0.59 for B complement union F. Probabilities involving compound events need not just involve two interacting elementary events. Compound events can involve three or even more elementary events. The next example illustrates what to do when there are three elementary events that are interacting. A country with a fledgling democracy is holding its first legislative session. Legislation to be considered will include bills that would allocate money to infrastructure projects. We'll denote this event by I. Bills that are related to national defense. We'll denote this event by D and bills that are related to energy policy. We'll denote these events by E. With systems with three or more elementary events, we're going to actually have to have a fair amount of given data. And so we'll imagine having the following data available concerning the relationships between our events I, D, and E. Probability of I is 41%, probability of D is 32%, probability of E is 55%, Probability of I but not D is 32%. Probability of D union E is 71%. The probability of I intersect E is 20%. And the probability of I intersect D intersect E is 7%. In general, we'll want to have a piece of information for each of the three elementary events themselves, a piece of information for each of the three possible pairwise 
uh, interactions between the elementary events, and then one piece of information for one three-way interaction between the three elementary events. Now notice that we have the three-way intersection. Probability of I intersect D intersect E is 7%, so we'll immediately label that on our Venn diagram. Well, our next goal is to label the probabilities in the unlabeled sectors of each of the three two-way intersections that exist between the three elementary events in our system. And we'll start with working on the I intersect E intersection. There's the unlabeled sector in I intersect E is I intersect E but not D. It's the part that's common to I and E that doesn't overlap at all with D. So we need to find the probability of I intersect E but not D. And we know from our given information that the total probability in I intersect E is 20%. But we've already allocated 7% of that probability to the three-way intersection I intersect D intersect E. So that leaves only 13% left over to uh, go into the I intersect E but not D event. So we can see then that the probability of I intersect E but not D is 20% minus the already allocated 7%, which equals 13%. We can try to follow a similar approach to finish allocating probabilities to the remaining intersections but we'll have an additional hurdle for each of them. For instance, if we were to begin working with the intersection between D and E, what we notice is that we don't have the intersection between D and E as given information. We don't know the total probability for the intersection between D and E. What we do know is the union. And so an initial step that we'll have to do computationally is to exchange that union, uh, P of D union E equals 71%, for the intersection between D and E. And we can use the general addition formula to do that, where P of D intersect E equals P of D plus P of E minus P of the union. And those quantities on the right-hand side of that expression are all known to us, so we can simply plug them into our formula and determine that the total probability of the intersection between D and E, probability of D intersect E, in other words, is just 16%. And now that we know that, we can go and look at the intersection between D and E on the Venn diagram, observe that 7% of the total probability, 7% of the 16, has already been allocated to the three-way intersection between I, D, and E, so we only have 9% left for the remaining sector, which is what's represented by the probability of D intersect E, but not I. So we'll, we'll label that sector with 9% of probability. We have one remaining two-way intersection in our Venn diagram to finish labeling, and that's the intersection between I and D. Now, in order to finish labeling the unallocated sector in any of our intersections so far, it's been important to have the total probability for that intersection as a known, and we don't know that. We don't even know the union. What we do have given, though, is the probability of a relative complement, the probability of I but not D, and that's 32%. And so in order to get the necessary knowledge of the total probability of the intersection between I and D, we need to follow a, a strategy of converting what we know about the relative complement to knowledge about the intersection. And we, we can do that with the relative complement formula. We can relate the relative complement of two events to the intersection between the two events. And that's our formula in the top right of the screen, where the probability of I intersect D is just equal to the probability of I minus the probability of the relative complement, I but not D. And those quantities on the right-hand side are known. We know the probability of I is 41%, and the probability of the relative complement between I and D is 32%. So when we plug them into the formula, we can learn that the pro total probability of the intersection between I and D is 41 minus 32%, or 9%. 
So now that we know that there's a total of 9% in the intersection between I and D, and that we also know that we've already allocated seven of that 9% to the three-way intersection sector, then there's only 2% left over to allocate to the I intersect D, but not E sector. And so that's what we've labeled on our Venn diagram, which brings us to the conclusion of labeling the probabilities of the unknown sectors of our three two-way intersections. Well, now that we've completed labeling the probabilities of the two-way intersections, we're pretty well positioned to be able to finish labeling the unknown probabilities within each of our elementary event circles in the Venn diagram. What's left in each of those three circles is the event that represent or the, the events that represent the probability of only I or only D or only E at the exclusion of the other events. To see how we would assign a probability to these sectors that represent the exclusive events of only I or only D or only E, let's just consider starting with I, with the I event. We know the total probability for I is 41%. That was given to us. But we can also see that we've already allocated probabilities to the parts of I that interact or intersect with either D or E or possibly both. That's 2%, 7%, and 13%. So we've already allocated a total of 22% out of that 41% that needs to be allocated to I. So we just ask, well, what's left? And that's 19%. So if we allocate 19% of probability to the exclusive part of I, only I, which is just I but not D or E, then that fills out a total of 41% within the I event. And we're done with the I event at that point. Likewise, for D, we know there's a total of 32% that needs to be allocated, but we've already allocated 2%, 7%, and 9% to the parts of D that interact or intersect with I and E. So that's a total of 18% that's already been allocated, and we need 14% more to get to the total of 32% that we know has to be allocated to the D event itself. So we'll assign probability of 14% to the D, but not I or E sector of the Venn diagram. Finally, following very similar logic, we can assign a probability to the remaining unallocated sector of E. We've already allocated 13% and 7% and 9% of probability to the parts of E that interact with I or D. We also know that there's a total of 55% of probability that must be allocated to E overall. So if we've allocated 13% and 7% and 9% to the parts of E that interact with I and D, or we've already allocated 29%, then we've got 26% of probability left to go before we can allocate the total of 55% probability needed to E. So that 26% of probability is what will go in the E, but not I or D sector. At this point, we've now allocated all of the probability there is to allocate to legislative bills that have to do with infrastructure or national defense or energy policy to I, D, or E. In other words, we've allocated all the probability there is to allocate to the interior of the I, D, or E circles. The only event in the Venn diagram that's left in need of probability is the event that a legislative bill is not related to infrastructure or national defense or energy policy. In other words, we need to know what probability to allocate to the exterior of the I, D, or E circles. And to do that, we just need to add up what is inside of the I, D, or E circles. It turns out that that's 90%, and subtract that from 100%, and that leaves us with 10% for the exterior, and that's what we'll assign there.
In other words, we have found that the probability of the complement of I or D or E, or the probability of the complement of I union D union E is just 10%. And we label the exterior of the ID or E circles with 10% in our diagram. So at this point, our Venn diagram is completely labeled. And as we saw in the previous example, we're now well positioned to be able to efficiently compute probabilities of just about any compound event that we can dream up that describes an interaction between I or D or E. For instance, we might want to know the probability that a piece of legislation relates to national defense, but not energy policy. This is P of D, but not E. If we shade the part of D in our Venn diagram that doesn't overlap at all with E, then we've shaded the probability of D, but not E. And all we need to do is add up the probabilities that fall within that region. That's 2% plus 14% or 16%. So we can conclude that the probability of D but not E is 16%. We might also be interested in computing the probability that a piece of legislation neither allocates funding to infrastructure nor relates to energy policy. This is the probability of the complement of I union E. If we think about how we would shade that in the diagram, we're just shading everything outside of I union E or everything outside of the I or E circles. The probability that's been allocated to the sectors in that region is just 10% and 14%, or a total of 24%. So we can conclude that the probability of the complement of I union E is just 24%. There's nothing to stop us from considering compound events that involve interactions between three of our elementary events. For instance, we might want to know about the probability that a piece of legislation relates to energy policy, or it allocates money to infrastructure and relates to national defense. This is the probability of E union the intersection event I intersect D. We'd have to ask ourselves how we'd go about representing that event through shading on our Venn diagram. And fundamentally, what we're talking about is a union. So we'd begin by shading the first event in that union, the probability of E. And that's the entire E event circle. But then we're going to take the second event in the, that union, which is I intersect D, and go right on and continue shading that. So we're shading the intersection between I and D. And so that gives us all of E plus the 2% part of the intersection between I and D. If we simply account for the probabilities that fall in that shaded region, we're just adding up 2% and 13% and 7% and 9% and 26% to get a total of 57% probability for the event E union quantity I intersect D. Well, we can consider one more. Let's imagine that we're interested in the probability that a piece of legislation relates to energy policy or national defense, but it does not allocate money to infrastructure. So we would represent this event symbolically as the probability of E union D, but not I. So fundamentally, this is a relative complement. If we want to understand how to shade that in our Venn diagram, we'll take the first part of that relative complement, E union D. So that by itself would just be the entire interior of the E and D circles. But it's a relative complement, so we're excluding something from that region. In this case, we're excluding I from that. So if there's any part of that region that overlaps the I circle or the I event, then we, we exclude it. We cut it out. We only shade the parts of E union D that don't overlap with I. Well, that results in a probability of 26% plus 9% plus 14%, or a total of 49%. So we can conclude that the probability of E union D, but not I, 
or the probability that a piece of legislation relates to energy policy or national defense that does not allocate money to infrastructure is 49%. Well, that brings us to the end of our video lesson on computing probabilities of compound events. But I think we need to reflect a little bit on the examples that we've worked through and try to determine if there's a general strategy that we can follow when analyzing systems of elementary events and how they interact to produce compound events. The process that I was trying to model with these examples is first read the scenario, understand the scenario that you're studying, try to determine if there are two or more elementary events within that, that scenario, and then identify them. Then devise symbolic labels for those elementary events. In my case, these were just single letter labels, and that's usually fine. Then determine if you've got any information that's given to you about the probabilities for those elementary events, and perhaps for probabilities of compound events that represent interactions between them. If you've got any hope of moving forward, it's going to be because you know something about the intersections between two or more of your elementary events. So a very good intermediate goal is to take the information that you've been given and use it together with some algebra to obtain information about all of the intersections within your system. Once you know the intersections, you can typically begin labeling all of the unlabeled sector of sectors of your Venn diagram from the center outward until you know everything. Once you've done that, once you've got a completely labeled Venn diagram in terms of probability, then computing probabilities of other compound events simply boils down to identifying the region represented by that compound event in your Venn diagram and adding up the probabilities of the individual sectors that appear within it. So this strategy works pretty well if you anticipate having a lot of different compound events within your system that you hope to compute, because all you're doing is really efficiently applying, applying just as much algebra as you need to complete your Venn diagram, and then you efficiently use your Venn diagram to, just by inspection, compute the remaining probabilities of compound events that you're interested in studying. Well, now we really are at the end of our video lesson on computing probabilities of compound events. Look forward to having you back for our next video lesson, and I hope this one was helpful. Thank you for watching.